second lecture, we'll be talking about ONS trial and execution. Our objectives for this lecture are to understand what happened to Chungun An after he killed Ito Hirobumi, to understand the characteristics and course of his trial, and to understand what An tried to do at his trial and why he was not able to do so, and finally to examine the course of An's last days. Now if we talk about the immediate aftermath of An's killing of Ito Hirobumi, we have to keep in mind that the international situation at the time was very, very complex, right? First of all, An Chungun killed Ito Hirobumi at Harbin uh, railway station, which is located in uh, the region of Manchuria, which was territory that technically belonged to China, right? Uh, at this time period, though, China was uh, very weak. It was still ruled by the Qing dynasty, but um, about two years after Ito Hirobumi um, was killed by An, the Qing dynasty would actually be overthrown and the Chinese Republic would be set up in its stead. So this was a time of a very weak China. And because China was weak, uh, there, there was this struggle over, this re over who was going to actually control this region, uh, similar to the struggle that had been going on over Korea, between Russia and Japan. Right? And we talked about that in our last lecture by discussing how Ito Hirobumi was actually there in part in order to talk to the Russian finance minister about how they could divvy up power in Manchuria. So An Chungun killed Ito Hirobumi, a Japanese citizen, on Chinese territory, which was technically controlled and administered by the Russians. Right, This was the part of Manchuria that was under Russian uh, influence, right? There were, it was actually Russian soldiers who would in fact arrest Chungun An. So this is a kind of a tricky uh, situation in terms of jurisdiction and which law would apply because you had a Korean uh, who was a member, um, and Korea at this time was under a Japanese protectorate who killed a, J a Japanese subject on Chinese territory administered and controlled by Russians. So this was a fairly complex situation. What in a sense made it a little bit more simple though, was that after a fairly short interrogation, the Russians just transferred on to the Japanese legation. They, the, the Russians said, here you go, here is on. And this was itself very important. Um, uh, like I said, this kind of simplified things because you know they, the Japanese now have on, so they can kind of decide what they're gonna do with him. And the Russians seem to have done this in part they didn't really care about, about dealing with this situation, um, not uh, giving him to the Japanese to deal with what, of course, made the Japanese very upset. And in the interest of goodwill, it seems, they, they just handed him over. They were just simply not interested in dealing with this problem. Dealing with it would have made the Japanese angry. The Japanese wanted to deal with it. So they did that. And shortly after An Chungun was transferred to the Japanese legation, he was then moved to the uh, prison in Lushun. Now Lushun was a very important place um, for a couple reasons. It was known in the West as Port Arthur and during the Sino-Japanese and later Russo-Japanese wars there had been major battles there over who was going to control it. Um, a lot of Japanese actually died uh, in particular during the Russo-Japanese war assaulting uh, Lushun slash Port Arthur and this was also the seat of the Japanese government general uh, known as the Kwantung government general in Manchuria. So this is the area, kind of the center of the Japanese administration in Manchuria, which as a reminder, <laughs> again, was Chinese territory uh, that the Japanese are, are administering and expanding their power into. So very quickly, An Chungun is, is taken, uh, it falls under Japanese um, control. Uh, he is interrogated there, um, by the, uh, by the Japanese, and we'll talk a little bit more about those interrogations later. Now, the um, reactions to the um, assassination, of course, the Japanese, for the most part, were extraordinarily hostile. They were not happy, um, both in terms of the government and the popular press. They were very, very critical of An Chungun, and of course, uh, very pra uh, praised Ito Hirobumi to a great extent. Even people who didn't particularly like him, of course, now that he was, had been assassinated, were, were not going to say a whole lot of bad things about him. Um, Korean reactions, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those later, but basically, um, because Korea had fallen under Japanese control by this time, they weren't, um, it, Koreans on the peninsula weren't able to really say much. Um, the Korean government officially mourned Ito Hirobumi they had services for him. They tried to donate money to his widow. 
um, they sent uh, delegates to the uh, Ito's funeral that was conducted in Japan and issued like a, a mission of apology. So, um, and this is no surprise since the Korean government was basically controlled by the, the Japanese and pro-Japanese Koreans at this time. Uh, Korean newspapers um, acted in a similar fashion for the most part. Um, of course, not doing so would have gotten them into a, a lot of trouble. But we know, do know that not all Koreans were, were happy with this. Um, the um, Koreans who uh, uh, some of the would secretly or um, do their best to kind of express their frustrate or their, their the fact that they were happy about what um, had happened to Hirobumi they supported on um, in Korea, but for the most part they had to do that secretly because they would face um, attacks or prison from the Japanese controlled Korean government or the Japanese themselves if they were to, do, to say anything publicly supporting on. But we'll come back to Korean reactions later outside the peninsula. Uh, but here's the thing. Um, if you look at this from a kind of political perspective, Japan faces um, kind of a problem. They want to make sure that the killing of Ito is seen as illegitimate, right? They want to make sure that the, as many people in the world see this ki Ons killing of Ito as wrong. And one reason they want to do that is because if it wasn't wrong, then that calls into question the Japanese colonial project in Korea that Ito Hirobumi had led, right? It was one of the things that people immediately knew um, was that a Korean had killed the man who was responsible for the colonization of Korea, right? The man who was most responsible for that colonization. So it's very, the Japanese government was very concerned, as we'll see in Japanese supporters of that colonial project, were very concerned with how this was seen worldwide. And I'll talk more about that as we proceed. Now, keeping in mind the perceived rightness or wrongness of An's uh, act and how that reflects on the colonial period, I want us to look briefly at a poem that An wrote a couple of days before he shot Ito Hirobumi and submitted to a Korean newspaper uh, published in Vladivostok. And the poem reads thusly, When a great man is in the world, his intentions are lofty. Surveying the world, when should he accomplish his deed? The times make the hero, and the hero makes the times. The east wind is blowing colder, but the great man's righteousness burns hot. Full of anger and bitterness, he will decisively accomplish his goal. You rat thief Ito, how can you escape death? How can things have come to this? And yet the situation is becoming worse. Countrymen, my countrymen, quickly accomplish this great work. Long live Korean independence. Long live our fellow Koreans. So in this poem, An Chung-gun expressed his emotion, his anger and frustration at this current situation that uh, Korea faced. And he also explained why he targeted Ito and he expressed his desire that his act would inspire other Koreans. Now, all this makes sense when we consider that this um, context for his poem was a Korean audience, right? He expected this to be read by a Korean audience. It wouldn't necessarily make sense, though, to an international audience. And chances are they would never see it, right? Because it's intended to be published to a Korean um, reading group who would be looking at this this Korean newspaper published in Russia. And, and this also means it would be difficult for Koreans in Korea to read it. And so, like I said, his act makes sense. But here's the problem. There's an international struggle over how to interpret An's killing of Ito Hirobumi. And that killing of Ito Hirobumi is um, tightly connected to Japan's colonial project. If An's killing of Ito Hirobumi was right, then the Japan's colonial project in Korea was wrong, right? On the, in, and the other way around is also correct. If the killing of Ito Hirobumi was wrong, then Japan's colonial project was right. And the, what makes it very difficult now is that On is in Japanese custody, right? Th that poem was the only thing he really wrote before he was in Japanese custody explaining what he was trying to do, right? What he was trying to accomplish. But now there's going to be this war, in a sense, over international opinion. And I'll talk more shortly about why that is so important. But he's not going to be able to explain himself. While the, uh, as we'll see shortly, 
uh, very clearly, he's going to be very limited in what he can say, whereas the Japanese and their supporters are going to be able to say a lot and speak freely. So now we're going to look at this war for public opinion, starting with a newspaper called the Seoul Press. And the Seoul Press is interesting because it was an English language newspaper published in Korea. And this was a time when the number of English readers in Korea, um, native English readers, would have only been a few hundred, right? Mostly missionaries. And it's not nearly enough people to support a newspaper of its size. However, it received a lot of subsidies from the Japanese colonial government because it was, in a sense, basically propaganda for the Japanese colonial government in Korea, right? So when you look at the Seoul Press, you're looking at a newspaper that's basically kind of the unofficial mouthpiece for the Japanese colonial government. And it, of course, is going to say that the killing of Ito Hirobumi was wrong and that the Japanese colonial project in Korea was right. And you can see how these things are connected. For example, here's a quote written in a editorial on October 28th, 1909, which would have been two days after Ito Hirobumi had been killed. And it says, the greatest of our statesmen and the best friend of Korea and her people died a martyr to the cause of humanity and civilization in a foreign land. So it's in this one sentence, they make very interesting claims, right? Um, Ito Hirobumi was a great statesman. He was someone who wanted to help and protect Korea and her people. And he died um, on a mission to do this, right? His mission was not imperialistic. It was not expansionistic. It was for the good of people and for civilization right, to bring progress, right? So that's who this guy was. He was killed trying to do these things. So in a sense, that means the colonial project that he helped organize in Korea was also right. And it also goes on to say uh, it, that he advanced the cause of peace, that he loved Korea as a father. And that's a, that's a really kind of good propaganda um, argument to make, right? Because, you know, he, on one side, it shows that he's, he cares about Korea, but he's also dominant, right? He's the father, you got to obey him. And they even went so far as to say he was criticized by other Japanese for being too friendly to Koreans. So here you can say that um, how the Japanese colonial um, government through this newspaper is showing, is making this connection right. It was wrong to kill Ito. Why was it wrong to kill Ito? Because he was someone who wanted to benefit Koreans. Now, a lot of the Western English language reactions were similar to this, maybe not as effusive, but they said very similar things. They praised Ito for modernizing Japan, which implies that they would have done the same thing to Korea. They emphasized that he helped with the framing of the Japanese constitution, um, and therefore that ties into democracy, makes him seem civilized. They emphasized that he was a moderate leader despite Korean provocations. So the idea here is that the it's putting the kind of, um, the Koreans are the ones that are the villains, right? They're the ones that are kind of acting badly. You know, you have this good civilized man who's just trying to help Korea become an enlightened country and they're fighting against that. And But despite that, he stays moderate. And that he was willing to die for the cause of peace. That he was in fact the best friend of Koreans. So sometimes the language is almost the same. So the narrative here that is not only in Japanese kind of propaganda, but also in the Western English language press, is that Ito was an innocent victim who only wanted to do good, and he was killed by a barbaric Korean. And this reinforces this kind of narrative, this kind of story that the Japanese were telling, that they were in Korea to fix Korea, to make it civilized, right? They're not there simply for their own expansionist desires, for their own empire. They're there to fix Korea, to help Koreans. And this is their reward for it, is they're killed um, by this barbaric Korean. And on being in prison can't um, try and deal with this uh, clearly. And I want to kind of give you a, a concrete example um, of how this kind of reflects on on. And, and this is um, from an article that appeared in the New York Times on October 27th, 1909. And this is, of course, almost immediately after the assassination, which took place on October 26th, 1909. And I want to stress, it's appearing in the New York Times. So this is big news. Um, and the article in part reads, It is well known that Korea, under its former government, was infested by corruption, favoritism, and oppression of the masses to an extent difficult for Occidental minds to grasp. 
much of the opposition to Japan was undoubtedly due to the stern suppression of abuses by which the favored class grew rich and the people were exploited. That the method and the manner of the Japanese were severe and even cruel is generally reported, though not undisputed. It may very well be that the assassin of Prince Ito belonged to the privileged class. Now, this article is, is interesting. On, on one point, you can see a little bit of critique of the Japanese colonial project because they said some, they said some people claim they're severe and even cruel, um, but some people also say this isn't the case. But what's key here, I think, for us is how On is being misunderstood, right? This is presenting On's act not as the act um, of someone who's concerned with peace in the East, not as someone who is a reformer, not as someone who is honestly concerned about their country, but as someone who's angry um, that the Japanese are trying to clean up and civilize Korea and deal with corruption and all these other problems. And this is amazing in a sense, because um, for one thing, it, it presents Korea, Koreans are not the victims, right? They're the bad guys here. But also, of course, we know from the previous lecture, this isn't who An was. An was not part of the government. He was not part of the privileged classes in, in, in many ways, right? Even though he was a, a young Von, he was a marginal young Von um, from the North who um, was not in positions of power. And that's one reason that he was willing to engage in reform because he wasn't connected to the old sources of power so much. So An is really misunderstood here. And again, the problem is because the Japanese have control over him, he doesn't, he can't dispute these um, kind of portrayals of him. And he may not even know about them. This is not to say, though, that no one challenged Japanese claims, right? Um, people did. In particular, Koreans in Hawaii did this, right? For example, there was a circular issued by the Korean Patriarch League of Hawaii that was printed in American newspapers, right? Um, for, and they issued a nationalistic critique of Ito and the Japanese colonial project in Korea, said, you know, Korea should be free, it should be independent. And they praised on and said it was right to, to do what he did. And like I said, this was printed in other places. Um, more extensively, the Korean National Association also wrote letters um, and the... Uh, challenging the Japanese story that issued a critique of Japan and Edo for using force and trickery to take over Korea and who presented Koreans as being like Americans and struggling for their independence. They said directly, you know, uh, Koreans were, were like the Americans who under George Washington had to fight for independence. And in fact, you know what? We're both threatened by Japan because Japan is trying to expand um, and gain more power in Asia. And that actually threatens America's interests. What's interesting, though, is that this Korean National Association letter, though, said the assassination was wrong. And I think that's interesting. And, I'll, um, and we may ask ourselves, why is it that they would, would do that? I just said that there was this kind of connection, right? If you say that the assassination was right, then the Japanese colonial project is wrong, and vice versa. If the, if the assassination was wrong, the Japanese colonial project is right. So what's going on there? Well, here's the problem for Koreans living abroad. And I'm, I'm just, I'm focusing on the Koreans in the United States in particular here. So Koreans in the United States and elsewhere are living in, the, in a United States that is an empire, right? Um, Americans, we, we don't like to admit that we were an empire and we maybe are an empire today, depending on how you define it, but we, we don't think that way, uh, though we probably should. But at this time, we were definitely an empire, right? Uh, in 1898, we had annexed the Hawaii and we annexed the Philippines. And of course, we also gained Puerto Rico and some other territories in our war with Spain. So Koreans lived in an American empire. And so they had to deal with this, this kind of disadvantage they had is that Americans are going to naturally be more sympathetic in many ways to Japan than they are to Korea because they're an empire, we're an empire. And that's why that letter tried to say, no, 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 the Americans are more, you know, we Koreans are like you Americans because we're fighting for independence like you are. And that's, I think, why they tried to make that argument because they wanted to try and make us not identify with Japan. But we're more likely to identify with Japan, right? Because they're an empire, we're an empire. We face similar situations. They face assassination attempts on their government officials. We may face the same. And in fact, this isn't just, so there's this kind of pressure then on, on Koreans. And this pressure, um, this pressure, found its way into immigration law. So for example, in Hawaii, there was a law 
where you could be deported if you were living in Hawaii and you expressed or published sentiments favoring the assassination of officials. You could be deported. And in fact, a Chinese who a named Lo Sun, who was publishing um, in a Chinese language newspaper, was deported because of his support of An's assassination of Ito. And Syngman Rhee, to show you this, this isn't just a kind of government thing, he talked about how after the assassination, um, people were afraid to talk to him in the United States. Sigmund Rhee was studying in the United States at this time, and um, when he submitted his uh, thesis, um, it was mailed back to him. The professor didn't want didn't to meet with him personally because of this kind of fear over Koreans. So Koreans are going to try and challenge the Japanese narrative that says that it was wrong for On to kill Ito and the Japanese colonial project in Japan, or I'm sorry, in Korea is fine, is good, but they're very limited. Right. They, they, they face a serious disadvantage, both in terms of how they are um, under pressure from the United States through things like immigration law, but also simply because Americans are more likely to identify with Japan. However, despite these limitations, An Chungun's killing of Ito Hirobumi is still going to pose a challenge to Japan, particularly the fact that this killing occurred um, on Chinese territory controlled by Russians involved a Korean killing a Japanese, right? It was an international incident. First of all, it simply puts Japan and its colonial project in Korea in the news in a not too friendly light, right? I mean, people can do the math. You have a Korean killing a Japanese. Obviously, it's because of what Japan's doing in Korea. That means um, that there's something going on here, right? Not everyone is happy in Korea with what the Japanese are doing there. And moreover, and so there were multiple articles, particularly in um, American newspapers based out of California that were anti-Japanese, that said, you know, Korea, Korea was colonized through force and trickery. And they depicted Ito Hirobumi not so much as someone who brought civilization, but as a tyrant who came in and lied to people and used force to take over Korea. So this does allow criticism. And to give you an ex example of this, for example, um, this is from the Toronto Globe. This article stated, no Egyptian apparently ever thought of assassinating Lord Cromer by way of repaying him for lightening the burden of taxation while developing the greatest system of internal public works in any country of the area and population of Egypt. So what this article is saying is, hey, you know, um, the Japanese aren't doing that great in Korea. Uh, you know, Lord Cromer was in charge, was governor general essentially of, of Egypt and no one tried to kill him because he did a great job. But Ito Hirobumi, maybe he wasn't doing such a good job, and that's why he was assassinated. And then the question, of course, is what was Ito doing in Manchuria anyway? Right? Um, Americans were very concerned that, despite Japanese promises to the contrary, that they and Russia would try and make Manchuria an area for their own economic benefit rather than following an open-door policy. Right? Um Americans were very concerned that they would be able to have the right to trade Manchuria and that this wouldn't just be divided into this kind of Russian-Japanese sphere of influence. And all of this, moreover, is connected to just a general fear that maybe the Japanese were not so civilized, right? The, the fact that um, Ito Hirobumi was considered a kind of civilian and part of a civilian faction versus a military faction in Japan and that the military faction would not be would be very cruel and very severe to Koreans, that came out in English language coverage. And so there was this kind of understanding that maybe the Japanese, and this is in many ways kind of racist, that the Japanese were not that civilized, right? They had a veneer of civilization over them, but being Asian, they could easily lapse into barbarism. So Japan, it doesn't look so good, right? It's not looking good. Um, to a large extent in this coverage. So what did the supporters of Japanese colonialism want, right? Well, first of all, um, they wanted to maintain good relations with other empires, right? It was important for them to stay on good terms with the United States, um, with Russia, with whom they were dealing with over Manchuria. Uh, Britain was a technically an ally of Japan. Um, they had an alliance with them and they wanted to keep that relationship good. They also want to show that they were a civilized country. The Japanese were very concerned with this, since they were stung by these kind of implication, this kind of implying that maybe they weren't so civilized. <clears throat> it's important to be seen as a civilized country because, as we saw, um, 
they were able, people justified Japan's colonization of Korea by saying it's not civilized. So it's important that people think you're civilized. They also wanted to gain acceptance for their growing power in Korea. And in particular, they wanted Western countries to surrender their extraterritorial rights in Korea, particularly in regards to judicial jurisdiction, right? They wanted um, basically for, um, they didn't want Western countries to have extraterritoriality for their citizens in Korea. They wanted those people to be tried in the Japanese slash Korean run courts in Korea. And all these things, as we've seen, were challenged by the assassination, right? The assassination of Ito created space in which all this could, Japan could be criticized in these ways. As we saw, there was some of that actual criticism. And Japan is going to try and resolve these problems and deal with these criticisms through propagandas. We, we've seen, right, they issued these kind of statements through their mouthpiece, and, and I won't go into it in this lecture, but they, they, they were really trying to keep a, a, an idea of what was going on and writing letters to the editor and all sorts of things. Um, but they also need to have be sure that their trial show that the Anchungun will have, and he has to have a trial. You can't just deal with this um, this international incident quietly. They have to show that they are a, a civilized power who will civilize Korea, right? So they can deal with these problems through propaganda and through the trial of Anchungun himself. So Thomas Anchungun and the three other men who were arrested with him um, will be put on trial, right? They're going to actually have a trial and an open trial that people can go see. And this is an image of that. Um, you had to get a ticket to go see it, but I believe they were basically on a, except for a few reserved ones, were on a first come, first served basis. So so Anchungun and these men who were uh, um, his kind of co-defendants are going to be given a open trial. Now, from the period of when On is arrested in October until February, when the um, trial is actually held, on is going to be um, interrogated, and he's going to be in a Japanese jail, this jail in Mushun. And what's interesting is that On seems to actually have been treated well. Um, he actually appears to have gained, gained weight while he was a prisoner. Um, and On, in his autobiography himself, records how he was treated well, how he was given extra blankets and clothes. He was given, not only was he given a lot of food, he was given particularly good food. He was given snacks, milk, chicken. He was even given, um, to quote him, good Egyptian cigarettes. And, you know, this, this is interesting, right? They treated him well. And I should point out that this was a time when Japan and Korea would use torture um, quite liberally with people who resisted the Japanese colonial project in Korea. So why would they treat on well? And there are several reasons. One, of course, is that this is going to, he's going to go to trial internationally. He's not some poor Korean guerrilla soldier who was captured in Korea that, that no one in the West knows about. You know, he, the killing of Ito was an international incident. But also they want to treat him well in hopes that he will give information. They want to find the extent of the plot to kill Ito, right? How many people were involved and uh, how were they involved? And even today, there's still controversy about this because Ahn did a pretty good job of keeping things quiet. Um, and they also want to convince Ahn to change his views, right? They want to convince Ahn that he had been wrong to kill Ito, that he had misunderstood Ito. And what's fascinating, and unfortunately we, we don't have time to do this here, but if you look at um, the interrogation reports, they will argue back and forth, the, the prosecutor who's interrogating on and on about um, these issues, about what Japan was doing in Korea. And what's fascinating about this is that on consistently challenges the facts behind Japanese official statements. The, the, prime, the, the prosecutor will say, well, you know, Japan has promised to do this and that for Korea. And on will say, well, yeah, but in fact, you're actually doing the, quite the opposite. And um, it's interesting because at times the prosecutor will will insult on and say, well, you're, you know, you're kind of stupid and you, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's kind of a sign you're losing the argument, right? So on actually did very well in his arguments with this professor by challenging, or I'm sorry, by this prosecutor, by challenging Japan's official statements and propaganda. And that's not good from the Japanese perspective. It means that if you put on on trial, he can actually get out his ideas, right? He can actually challenge the Japanese colonial project, and he can make Japan look really, really bad by challenging this propaganda. And this is going to influence how this trial is held, right? Um, how it's how it's conducted. So first of all, like I said, it's going to be a group trial. It's going to be on in these three other defendants. It's going to be held in Lushun, which is part of the Kwantung government general. Um, 
Japan has control of on. So they're going to deal with the issue of jurisdiction by saying, well, it's, it's, it's our, um, we need to follow Japanese law. Um, and it's we Japanese who are going to, to be taking care of this because after all, Japan is protecting Korea. And um, there's going to be six um, sessions of the trial and they'll take place from February 2nd to the 14th. And here's the thing, as I, as I said previously, on is able to challenge Japanese claims quite effectively. So they have to give on a trial that appears fair so that Japan will get credit for being a civilized country without in fact being fair because if it's a fair trial, on is going to be able to challenge Japan and make it look uncivilized and, and call into question Japan's colonial project. So what the Japanese um, will do, the Japanese government to control the trial, of course, they will use, uh, the, the trial of course will be in, in Japanese, um, which I mean, it, you know, I can kind of, uh, I can kind of understand that, but with very limited interpretation, it's clear when you read the trial transcripts the on doesn't always understand what's going on because they're only giving him partial translation. They're just giving him kind of an outline of what's going on. And this is a problem, right? Because how do you defend yourself and how do you, you make your arguments with very limited interpretation when you don't know what's happening? Um, in addition, An Chun Gun uh, was, and this is, this is really amazing to me <laughs> how clever this was in part, was On was given defense lawyers two Japanese defense lawyers. Um, and why is that a big deal? Well, it makes Japan look good because they said, hey, look, you know, our law doesn't even require us to provide a free public defender, but we're going to do that because we're a civilized country. Um, but then that allows them to control On's defense, right? Because these Japanese lawyers are very careful to provide a defense, which while competent, does not challenge Japanese colonial project. In addition, the trial is very rushed. Um, on is often told, hey, you talk too much. The judge will say to him, you talk too much. Um, you, need to, you need to not talk so much. And that's kind of a problematic thing to say. And what's fascinating about this, there's actually basically two trial transcripts. There's the official Japanese transcript, which leaves that stuff out. But there was also a, a Japanese newspaper reporter who knew how to take shorthand. And he wrote down his own interrogation records. And he has that in the ones that he published. So On was, um, the Japanese government left that out when the judge would tell him, hey, you need to hurry up. Um, but it's in the um, th that reporter's one. And the verdict had already been decided. The, the judge had been told, this is what you're going to find, and this is the punishment you should give before the trial even started, right? And and just to, you know, um, in one part, On's defense was considered so provocative that the court was actually cleared. When On was explaining why he killed Ito Hirobumi, at one point he's, he accused um, Ito Hirobumi of being behind the death of um, the Meiji Emperor's father, the, the emperor who preceded the Meiji Emperor. Um, and this wasn't true. I mean, uh, and An wasn't lying, but he was just wrong about that. Ito Hirobumi was not responsible for that. But that was considered such a dangerous thing to say that they, the judge actually cleared the courtroom. So we can see that this is a trial where An is kept very much under control. So the prosecutor's argument at trial was that An had essentially misunderstood Korea's situation and Ito's intentions. So, and this this is, it makes sense that the, that the prosecutor would make this argument. He's saying that, you know what, uh, Ito was a good guy, Korea was in a bad situation, and Ito was doing the best he could to help Korea. But An misunderstood Korea's actual situation and thought Ito was a bad guy, even though he clearly isn't, and that's why he did this, right? So Japan, the Japanese government wasn't doing anything wrong here. It was just this kind of this Korean guy didn't know what was going on. Moreover, um, they argued that, you know, An must have had a personal grudge against Ito because maybe Ito had some people executed that were On buddies or something like that. Because obviously um, Ito was no longer governor general, killing him wouldn't solve anything. So it must have been a personal grudge, right? An killed Ito for selfish reasons, not because he's a patriot. And they even went so far as to say that, you know, An Chun Gun was really a failure in life, right? He failed in his, um, for example, his attempt to build up this, um, this coal mine uh, as part of his self-strength or as part of the uh, patriotic enlightenment movement we discussed earlier. So clearly um, he tried to make people forget his failures by killing Ito. Now, never mind that the coal mine failed, in fact, be in part because of Japanese obstruction. <laughs> um, but, you know, th this is the prosecutor's argument. So, and because on 
um, because Koreans don't respect life because they use assassination so much, um, we need to punish him severely. He needs to be executed, right? So that's the, the prosecutor's argument. Now, there were attempts by English, Korean, and Russian lawyers to defend on. They were hired by different groups of people, but they were not allowed to defend on because they were foreigners, and foreigners were, were not allowed in Japanese law to defend him. And um, this, of course, was kind of a, a problem. This would have been helpful. Um, so they're not able to, to defend on. Um, and on has difficulty... Um, defending himself, as I said before, because he's not given um, full interpretation. He's told to rush himself. Um, so these are problems, right? On faces some some problems. In his... Now, as I said, though, he was given these Japanese lawyers, and they gave him a competent defense. Um, one of the lawyers basically argued that, you know, On misunderstood what Ida was doing. I grant you that. The Japanese colonial project in Korea was good. But he's a patriot, right? He sincerely cared. He's not a bad guy. And so we should treat him leniently. The other one argued simply, well, you know what? Japan, even though this is, um, Japan is has jurisdiction, it should apply Korean law because he's a Korean subject. And there's no applicable law in Korea to killing someone outside of Korea. So therefore, he should be let go. Now, in a sense, this wasn't a bad defense. I mean, it, it you know, it wasn't terrible, but what's key is it wasn't what An wanted. An wanted to challenge the Japanese colonial project in Korea. He wanted to make it sure that he understood exactly what Japan was doing. And specifically, he argued against this idea, saying that he should. there was no applicable law. Um, in his, his closing remarks, he said, you know, we have to have laws um, that, that should govern us. And um, so this is itself kind of um a, a, a problem right and this is what i mean is that in a sense japan looks very good because it gives him these defense lawyers but in fact they hindered his defense right they didn't give him the defense he wanted he wanted to challenge the japanese colonial project and argue that because that colonial project was wrong what he did was right now there were a couple times when on was finally allowed to speak and he did his best to speak and i want to look at one of those times and that was during his third trial session and in that trial session, he tried to make clear why it was he killed Ito Hirobumi and that he didn't misunderstand. And his argument was basically, first of all, I killed Ito to maintain peace in the East and to strengthen Korean independence. And that's one thing that a lot of An's defenders, um, especially the Korean defenders, missed was he wasn't just working for Korean independence. Um, he seems to have deeply understood that Korea's independence was closely linked to the overall peace and stability in East Asia. Right. So that's one thing is that he saw those two things together. He didn't see himself as only working for Korea. He was working for all the East. And that's, in a sense, what made him an Asianist to a certain extent. And he also wanted to emphasize that he was not, um, and this is something I think people sometimes misunderstand today about on, he was not anti-Japanese. He saw the Japanese emperor as someone who supported peace in the East, who wanted to strengthen Korean independence. After all, that's what the... Decla Japan's declaration in the Russo-Japanese War said, we're fighting in part to maintain Korean independence. And Japan had always said that, right? Remember in 1876, the Treaty of Kongwa said that Korea was independent. So clearly, from An's perspective, the Japanese emperor wanted to maintain peace in the East and to strengthen Korean independence, but Ito Hirobumi wasn't doing that, right? Ito Hirobumi was a bad official. So on presented Ito as working against peace and killing people indiscriminately. And now that On had removed Ito, had he had shown the world that Korea didn't, uh, or that Korea did not like what Ito was doing. What Ito was doing was wrong, right? On thought that Ito had tricked the Japanese emperor and was following his own kind of policy. And now that he had revealed to the world that what Ito um, was doing and that what he was doing was wrong, Japan now had the opportunity to change its policy. And if it followed a policy that brought true peace between Korea, Japan, and China, that would allow them to become more enlightened, right? They would work together, become more civilized and enlightened. And eventually, starting from there, the peace that they, want, that they would build would spread to the entire world. 
right? So An is not simply a Korean nationalist, right? He's not simply someone who just thinks about Korean independence. He understands it is connected to peace in the East. And his hope was that peace would allow for the development of humanity, would allow a kind of us to enjoy um, a more civilization. And eventually this peace would encompass the entire world, right? Even though An, in a sense, was an Asianist, he didn't see the world necessarily in complete conflict with itself. And we'll talk more about that later. Now, finally, one other important part that I should talk about that's a part of uh, just in general, some of the different things that On uh, believed and said was that he thought he should be treated in accordance with international law. He argued that he was a POW, essentially. He was a prisoner of war, that he killed Ito Hirobumi as an act of war, and therefore should be tried in accordance with international law. Now, I'm not sure exactly what law, international law, he thought he should be treated in accordance with. I, I think he basically just thought, well, I'm a soldier, I killed an enemy, so therefore, you know, what I did is 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 legitimate. But um, that was key to his kind of argument, right, that, that Japan didn't really have uh, jurisdiction and he should be tried in accordance with international law. It's no surprise, though, that On was found guilty. Uh, he was sentenced to death, whereas the other co-defendants received e, uh, comparatively light sentences. Um, on gave up his right to appeal. He could have appealed and continued the trial um, or to have another trial, but he d decided to give that up. He didn't really see a reason to continue doing that. But he gave it up because he understood that he would be given a stay of execution, right? He would be uh, given a little bit more time before he was killed so that he could finish his writings. And in particular, he wanted to finish his work on peace in East Asia. However, um, even though he understood himself to be promised a stay of execution, it was not in fact given. And so his uh, work on peace in the East is an unfinished work. Now, as I said, though, Japan had hoped to use this trial to show that it was civilized. And also there's this idea, right, if we can show that An was in fact guilty, that he was wrong to kill Ito, then that means that what Ito had been doing, i.e. his um, construction of a Japanese colonial government in Korea, then that's okay, right? Then we're right. Now, in, um, you can, and you can see that Japan was successful in its English language reactions to the trial. First of all, in most Western English language newspapers, there was actually little coverage of the trial or execution, which itself was pretty good for Japan because it meant that there was not really gonna be any criticism. Um, the one exception was the graphic, and it's it's interesting. Um, it's a British news uh, uh, magazine, basically. Um, on one side, Koreans like to quote it because it was respectful to On in many ways. It treated him as um, as a heroic figure and as a patriot, so it kind of challenged Japanese views there. But it basically accepted On's killing of Ito as illegitimate and the Japanese colonial project as legitimate, right? So it 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 didn't. Um, even though it treats on respectfully in many ways, it still says, you know, his killing of Ito was wrong and the Japanese colonial project in Korea is just fine. And that's the friendliest English language view I could find to on. So to give you some other examples, English language newspapers in China and Japan, for the most part, said the trial was fair and the verdict was correct. Moreover, they often took pains to say, you know what, Japan is a civilized country. And they, they didn't just stop there. They said, and Korea is not. And the example they gave was, you know what, uh, for example, An Chung Gun would have, um, you know, if, if he would have been tried in accordance to Korean law, then he would have been treated much more severely, right? Um, you know, even family members could have been punished and, and so forth. And what's fascinating to me is that the Seoul Press um, actually claimed that all four men recognized that what they had done was wrong and repented and said that they had been wrong to kill Ito. And they even made this claim about An, which, I mean, it's false, right? Han did not repent and say killing of Ito Hirobumi was wrong, but the Seoul Press would claim this. So basically, in terms of this kind of battle over international um, views of the uh, assassination of Ito and how it reflect on the Japanese colonial project, Japan wins, right? Japan is going to win this. So here's kind of the difficult situation that On faces. Right, he had not made it clear why he had killed Ito, and he what he wanted to happen before the trial. He seems to have thought that people would would automatically understand it, and so he tried to explain himself at trial. But at trial, he he hadn't been able to speak freely. Right, he'd been very limited in what he wanted to say. 
um, he did get some ideas out. He got his his basic ideas out um, why he killed Ito, but he he didn't he wasn't really ever able to say what he wanted to build, right? What he how he wanted to transform Asia, right? He said he wanted to to make this peace that would go throughout the world, but he he's not able to explain why. So what he has to do then is he has to make his ideas clear through what he writes in prison. And he will write two major documents in prison. One is an autobiography, which he finishes, and one is his work on peace in the East, which he is unable to finish uh, because he'll be executed before it could be finished. And we're fortunate, um, I mean, unfortunately for On, these, these writings of his never were revealed to the public in this time. So he wasn't able to get his ideas out. We're fortunate though, in that copies um, did exist, they were not destroyed, and they will be discovered in the 1970s. So that will, gives us an area, uh, gives us material so we can better understand An Chungun's ideas. Shortly before his execution, An Chungun, um, after repeated requests by his uh, family and his own requests, he will be visited by Father Joseph Wilhelm, the Catholic priest who had baptized him, and he will receive um, the sacrament of confession, he'll confess his sins, and he'll receive communion. Um, there's an interesting prison report that describes this, um, but you can tell by reading the prison report that On did not repent of killing Itohirobumi, that he thought that Itohirobumi was a bad guy, um, and that what he had done was right. Um, but being a good Catholic, On wanted to receive the sacraments before he was uh, executed. And he, in fact, basically ends his autobiography with that reception. An Chungun was then executed on in uh, March of 1910. He killed Ito Hirobumi um, in the morning of October 26, 1909, and he was executed on um, March 26, 1910. Um, it's interesting, he was actually executed on Holy Saturday. Um, the day before his execution was Good Friday, and then the day of um, after his execution was um, uh, Easter Sunday which you can read as having some significance. And August of that year, uh, 1910, Japan was finally uh, able to annex Korea. And unfortunately then An's act, though he, he had hoped it would be able to restore peace in the East and restore Korean independence, was not able to do so. And that's, I guess you could say, it's kind of the tragedy of what would happen. And of course, in many ways, um, whatever you think about this, about An's use of violence here, uh, in a sense, he was prophetic in his belief uh, that he, he states in his, his writings that eventually Japan's policies would lead to, to a war that would tear apart East Asia. And he was, in fact, correct um, about that. But we will talk more in the next lecture about his ideas and what he had hoped that he could establish. Um, in, uh, in terms of a peace that would encompass not only East Asia, but all the world.